Okay, I think it's time to go ahead and take the coffee off. Or the water, not the coffee. I didn't coffee yet. But I think it's, a, it's time to go ahead and get that water off. And make some campfire coffee. I hope you guys can see. I can't see what's going on in the GoPro here. But we'll go ahead and put this in the light so you can see. Oh yeah, that water is good and hot. So now I'm going to go ahead and put the little thing on here and let it sit for a few minutes and then I'll be right back. Hi, it's Lindley Oz and it's time for more campfire coffee talk with Lynn and I am letting the coffee make here and then here shortly we're going to drink some coffee and have some good coffee chat. Hey, it's coffee time with Lynn. I got my coffee poured and made, and it's really good drinking it in my wooden camping cup. So another night by the campfire. Awesome. I love it. Lots of lightning bugs out and stuff. It's really cool. So I was looking through the news, and I noticed there was an earthquake the other day that was quite large in Japan and uh, there was a lot of news on earthquakes in California and Israel just conducted a huge earthquake drill so that was interesting that was posted about eight hours ago so I'm wondering why all this attention suddenly about earthquakes you know, what's going on? Why all the stuff about these earthquakes? Now, everyone's concerned about Yellowstone, but there's actually a super volcano, a caldera, that is worse than Yellowstone, that is right there where the major earthquakes in California are taking place. Now, if that goes off, that's going to be worse than Yellowstone. I wish I had the name, but I really didn't plan out what I was going to talk about or I would have printed it up or something first and I'm using my phone to record so I can't look it up on my phone but what do you guys think of all these earthquakes there's some people that say well earthquakes have been happening for years and there's other people that are saying well yes they have but they're worse you know things are getting worse and escalating and this is a sign of the times which it is the bible specifically describes earthquakes in prophecy You know, if we had a big one, well, wait, I know that the, um, oh, what is it? There's the San Andreas, the New Madrid, which is the one I'm on. And, oh, uh, I think it's the Cascadia subduction zone. That one has been locked up for a long time, building up a lot of pressure. And even the New York Times put out a post several years ago saying it wasn't a question of if, but when. See, as long as that keeps building up pressure, it's going to get so bad that it's going to be huge. And what that could do is it could end up setting off a bunch of other events, which would be hellish and apocalyptic in nature. So we're seeing things happen. But I really like to look into what's going on with earthquakes because the Bible just so much describes earthquakes. It describes wars rumors of wars it describes persecution weird weather events hail hurricanes tornadoes it describes all these things so on that note with with those things because the bible tells us that also is not a question of if but when so i like to watch these things and relate it to Bible prophecy as to what's happening and what to expect. And we should. Jesus told us to watch the times, to watch things and pray and to be ready. 
there's a lot of people who apparently don't know the Bible and don't read the Bible. They just listen to a bunch of nonsense who will go and persecute people who are trying to wake people up and tell them, oh, you're not supposed to do that. That's fear and doom and gloom. Well, no, it's not. Go look at it for yourself. If you're going to say that, then you're saying that we should be in direct disobedience of the very instructions of Jesus Christ himself. Go look it up. He said it. So Jesus Christ himself told us to be watchful of these very things and to speak the truth of his word to others so that they would come to repentance and know him as their personal savior. I guess you probably like to see the fire real quick because it's really blazing right now. Let me turn on my GoPro. There you go. I just took a stab at it, so it's really flaming up. Nice. What do you guys think of this lukewarm church that we're seeing? These mega churches that have allowed Baal worship to corrupt it. I did a video and I took clips of David Wilkerson from his prophetic warning back in 1973. And I took each clip of the things he mentioned and played it and then showed news clips to reveal that most of his prophecies actually came to pass. That's right, they actually did. And I never knew there were churches with nude dancing. I always wondered about that one, but I actually found out there was, and it was sickening. And they had young girls running around and stuff, uh, half naked and nude. And they had these uh, tarot cards and stuff like that. I mean, how can you actually think that that is biblical or Christian? I don't know. But another thing, too, is the amount of hatred that is taking place in the world against true Christianity and the amount of hatred that we are also witnessing amongst people who are supposed to be Christians. My goodness, I read the comments sometimes beneath my videos of people who just come and make slams at me and judge me and tell me what I'm doing and why I did it and how horrible I am. I'll tell you what, those people don't know my heart at all. I'm not even that kind of a person. The things I get accused of. It's just sickening, the hatred and the judgment and the condemnation and people who do this actually believe they are Christians. That's what they believe. They think they're Christians and they think they're the Apostle Paul trying to do something. That is not godly. I'd like to ask all those people what they're doing for the Lord. How much time are they putting in every day? to try to reach people with the truth of God's word and to wake up the sleeping people and to bring people to repentance through the truth of God's word. Most of those people that do that are sitting around on their arse <laughs> doing nothing except complaining, nitpicking, condemning. And you know what? That's okay. That's totally okay because they're going to have to kneel before the Lord someday and answer for that. I have to answer for things, if I'm at fault in certain areas of my life, and there are areas I am in which I struggle, but I'm going to have to do the same thing. And because of what I do, I'm going to be even more accountable. So there's a loud cricket nearby. It's kind of cool. But there's just people out judging. Now, if I'm, if I'm actually doing something... And it's pretty obvious I'm doing something. Like if I'm out here running around in my bikini on camera and being all risque and sexual, then by all means, you know, we are to judge the fruit that people are producing. Then by all means, I would expect people to say something. I'm just sitting here doing humble camping videos. People make comments about my backside in the last video, but I'm not, I, just because I'm a woman, 
I'm not allowed to have my back facing the camera. I don't think about my backside. I was actually standing in front of the fire recording on my GoPro while I was recording on my phone here. And I was getting some clips of the fire with my GoPro. And I was trying to show just me in the video with the fire is all I'm trying to do. I think some people expect me to just be a floating head with arms, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I'm fully clothed wearing baggy pants. I don't know what the deal is. I have to admit it would be far more comfortable to wear some shorts or something, but I can only imagine if I had shorts on, even respectful shorts, <laughs> doing a video and people saw me in full, ooh, what I would get accused of. I sure hope you can hear me over the cricket. That cricket's pretty loud. I love the sound of crickets, but that thing is loud. So, I don't know. We're seeing hatred, people attacking each other, uh, earthquakes, strange weather, the, this fallen church that the Bible clearly talks about, the apostate church. You know, the book of Revelation starts off with uh, the different churches and the description of these end times churches and what they're at fault for and what, if anything, they're actually doing right. So I would suggest everybody turn to the book of Revelation and read about those churches. And you can clearly see that a lot of these churches that are being described are here, particularly the apostate church. That was one of the big signs of the end times is this apostate church. And also, um, I mentioned in my last video that uh, 2 Timothy, and I put the, the passage on the screen, but where it clearly describes this narcissist Jezebel spirit that enters the homes of women, it says. It says uh, naive, silly women who are caught up in sin. But... This narcissist Jezebel spirit is an end times demonic spirit. Jezebel's been around for many, many years. It got its name from Jezebel, the evil, wicked woman in the Bible, Jezebel and Ahab, who went after God's people, God's prophets specifically. And she ended up falling out of the window and being eaten alive by dogs. But um, she constantly tormented and went after to murder God's prophets. So that's where this demonic spirit got its name, Jezebel. So, so this Jezebel spirit that's been around for years, I believe is still here today. However, the one we're seeing today is a much more wicked, evil, more powerfully wicked, not more powerful than the Holy Spirit though, version and I believe that's what 2 Timothy is describing, because if you look at the symptoms and personality traits of a narcissist, and you compare the narcissist to a Jezebel spirit, they're one and the same. And there's tons of worldly articles even, and Christian articles, about this end times Jezebel spirit. I'm calling it the end times Jezebel spirit. They don't call it that in the articles, but they talk about this Jezebel spirit and, um, well, the Christian articles do the worldly articles talk about narcissism and there's Christian and worldly articles, both talking about narcissism and how it's just really gotten huge today. And the, this demonic spirit is very, very evil. Oh boy, is it evil. It'll destroy and devour and have no care, compassion, no conviction whatsoever. Um, you can just read tons of articles about narcissists. And you can also read comments beneath the articles of the hell that people who have lived with one or dealt with one have gone through. So this is a really evil thing. And... 
this demonic spirit is just devouring Christians left and right, particularly people who have a voice in these end times, but also just God's people in general. And it's horrible. So that's one big thing I feel that's here, but that's another sign of the time. So we have weather, we have the persecution of Christians in so many ways. Now you have the physical persecution that's been going on for a long time over in the Middle East and places like that, where people are getting hung on crosses, murdered, tortured, and all sorts of stuff. But the type of persecution that's going on here in the United States that I'm talking about is the persecution of censorship, uh, people losing their jobs, people getting sued, our children having to be subject to teachings and advertising and promoting of transgenderism, homosexuality, uh, all sorts of profane things being taught to them as normal. And then there's uh, nothing that the parents can do about it. I mean, there's all sorts of persecution. And then you've got the persecution among fellow believers who are just judging, tormenting, and ridiculing each other. And they come and attack people who are trying to put the truth out and reach people with the truth and accuse and slander. It's horrible. You know, slander is illegal. You can sue somebody for slander. And what is it? Um, defamation of character. You really can. If you want to take the time to do it, you can do that. That is illegal. So the world even views that as horrible, let alone as a Christian. If you're a Christian, you shouldn't be out attacking and slandering anyone. If you have a beef with somebody, you know, take it to them privately. I had some guy write to me the other day. He said, I contradicted myself. Because in the beginning of my video, I talked about how I never met a stranger. The end of my video, I talked about how nervous I get at speaking events. Or maybe, it, I think in the beginning, I said I get nervous at speaking events. And I have a hard time. And at the end, I said I never met a stranger and I could talk to anybody. Well, let me explain that. Which I wrote him back and explained that to him. And he said, oh, well, I stand corrected, basically. I mean, people are just finding the most nitpickiest things to attack you with. When I'm in a large group of people, I have trouble speaking in front of a large group of people. Or if I'm at an event in front of a large group of people, I struggle with people coming up to me and looking at me like I'm famous or um, making over me because I'm nothing. Nothing at all. And that, it makes me, I mean, I'm grateful and it's kind, but it makes me feel awkward because I'm nobody. And so I, I have trouble with that. But if I'm in a more private setting, like on an airplane, and that's one of the examples I use, I can just sit there and talk to anybody, no problem. It's when I'm um, on stage, like the focal point of attention, that's when I struggle. So I had somebody write to me about that. I have people that attack me for all sorts of things. But you know what? I get used to it. I've been getting attacked for years as long as I've been doing this. I get attacked. It goes with the territory. So really, it's no big deal. And it's something as Christians, we have to get used to. We're going to get attacked. So on a different note, how many of you have been struggling in the last year or so with attacks? Now, the attacks could be a particular sin you're struggling with. It's just been really hard to overcome. And really hard to repent for, like you feel stuck in it. The struggle could be persecution from someone or something, financial difficulties, sickness. I mean, it could be anything. So how many of you have really struggled uh, with something? And what I mean by the something is, like I just said, a tax. Because for me, it's been the worst in the last few years. It really has. Many of you that have been following me for a while, you know that because you've heard me talk about it openly. But um, there's some people who know me personally who know what the attacks have been. I guess what I want to say to you is that I'm sure many of you feel like you have been forgotten by the Lord or you feel like you've done something wrong 
and you feel like you're being punished, and I know this firsthand because I have people write to me and say that, or I read the comments, and there's people who leave comments that say that, and I've fallen into that trap myself before, just crying endlessly and asking God, what did I do wrong, you know? And then the worst part of it is when you see evil people or the people that are causing you the grief, they seem to succeed and get everything they want. Nothing happens to them. Meanwhile, you're sitting there just suffering and going through hell. And then you begin to get really frustrated at God sometimes thinking, wow, you know, why? What is this, Lord? Why? And I, you know what? I don't have the answers. I'm sure there's people out there that do because I get lots of people who seem to know pretty much everything. Trust me. So I'm sure there's people out there who have the answers. I've had some lovely people write and leave comments saying, well, people who are going through persecution have done something wrong. Really? Tell that to the people in the Middle East who are Christians who are getting murdered in horrible ways and strung up on crosses and getting decapitated. Tell that to them that they've done something wrong. Tell that to little children and unborn babies who suffer. What did they do wrong? Did they do something wrong too? I'd like to ask you all that question. I'm sorry, that makes me mad. When we suffer, it doesn't necessarily mean we're doing something wrong. Sometimes it does. Sometimes if you're caught up in sin and you're a Christian, the Lord will allow the enemy to have his way with you in order to get your attention. Sorry. In order to get your attention. And that'll happen sometimes too. Because the Lord's trying to wake you up and that's how he'll speak to you and trying to get your attention. And he will allow the enemy to persecute you and to be quite honest, if you've got a bunch of open doors in your life, which would be sin, sinful areas, and you're not shutting those doors, then quite honestly, it's your own fault. And you've got to close those doors. One thing I noticed lately, and this is really weird. I noticed, and I want to know if you guys have ever had this experience. You're really hurting over something. And... Maybe a situation in your life that's hurting you. Maybe you're having thoughts that are just painful and you keep dwelling on it and dwelling on it, trying to figure it out and going over and over and over in your mind, overthinking things. And so you bind it in the name of Jesus and you tell it to leave and command it to leave. But then you're almost asking for it to come back because you start thinking about it again. And it's almost as if you want to continue hurting. I know that may not make sense. Think about it. If you keep thinking about something and dwelling on something that has hurt you and has been painful for you, it hurts you. And is dwelling on it really going to solve the problem? No. So if it's not going to solve the problem, all you're doing is swimming around in a pool of pain and there's some stronghold that wants to keep suffering and wants you to suffer. And you got to bind that one too in the name of Jesus. You just got to say in the name of Jesus, you nasty demon of rejection. And, oh, what is the one I'm trying to think of to do with thoughts? I can't think of the word. I'm drawing a total blank for some reason. Uh, the Bible tells, oh, vain imaginations. The Bible tells us to cast down every thought that exalts itself against the Lord. So you have to rebuke and bind that demonic spirit that wants you to dwell on those things. And it's a habit that you have to break. And so at first you really have to work at it to do this. It's a lot of work and it's very, very hard because you're so used to a whole different way of thinking and it gets extremely hard. So that can be really difficult. So while you're going through the process of repenting, 
from these things, rebuking, binding, casting out, it's really a real job because you've got these strongholds that are at work 24-7 to just continue coming back and hammering you with these same thoughts. You also have certain ones that are assigned to you to make you stumble and make you fall that are just constantly going to keep nipping at your heels all of your life. And you've got to constantly fight them. And as a Christian, that's what this life is about. Walking in the spirit of truth of Jesus Christ and rejecting the things of the flesh. And when we're surrounded by things that entice our flesh, whether it's sexual images, lust, and when I say lust, I don't just mean sexual, anything. It could be food, um, money, uh, drugs, alcohol, anything, okay? So when you're constantly surrounded by things that entice your flesh, anger, things that make you angry, things that agitate you, that entice you, things that would entice you into anger, things that would entice you into bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, jealousies, fears, all sorts of things. And believe you me, just as much as you all, I struggle with being enticed. I live in this world, just like you. I'm not perfect. I live in a world surrounded by these things. When we get on the internet, somebody left in the comments that they got on the internet to do a search for something that was totally unrelated to anything sexual, and porn came up. So we're constantly being enticed. Now, it's not a sin to be tempted. If you're intentionally doing things to put temptation before you, that would be a sin, yes. But just innocent temptation where you're confronted with something you weren't expecting and you weren't looking for is a sin. So, we really have to grow some kahunas, so to speak, spiritually, and really stand strong. You have to just find a way to, like, kick it out of your brain, rebuke it, bind it. There's many of us, and I've done it too, where you rebuke and bind and nothing happens because we're surrounded by so much negativity and demonic spirits. If nothing happens... I would take a look at that and say, okay, why is nothing happening? Maybe it's something in your heart. Maybe there's something in your heart. You're binding and rebuking in your head, but your heart's telling a different story. That cricket is so loud. I mean, now it got quiet. I mean, it must be in there because when I shine the light on it, I love the sound of crickets, but a loud cricket right here by the microphone doing a video isn't pleasant, and I don't know how that's going to come out. But if you're binding and rebuking and nothing happens, either A, that's a real stronghold, and you need to go and pursue deliverance in Christian counsel, or there's some other area in your life where it's taken root that you need to get rid of and get to first. Like something underlying, like rejection, for instance, is often a spiritual root which manifests into other things. So it can be that. So we're binding, rebuking, living in a world that hates the Lord Jesus Christ and loves everything that's sinful. A world that calls what is evil good and what is good evil. A world that has almost both feet in the pits of hell. Actually, probably both feet are in the pits of hell. So we're just living in a very evil world, trying to live the way God wants us to. But you know one secret to that? Fall in love with the Lord. Many of us are in love with what we know about the Lord. And we struggle because we're trying to do what's right so that we can make it to heaven. Because nobody wants to go to hell. And that's a real problem. It's like if you had an addiction and somebody told you that you had to quit your addiction, but you didn't really want to quit. You wouldn't successfully give up that addiction. In the same sense, 
if you're trying to obey the Lord and serve the Lord because you just don't want to go to hell and it's the right thing to do, you're not going to succeed. You really have to have a change of heart, a change of mind. That's repentance. And you really have to fall in love with him. Think about this. Imagine you're married to an individual that you don't love. Maybe you had lust when you first got married. The fire has since fizzled, like my fire is getting ready to do. The fire has fizzled, and now you just have to force yourself to do the things you're supposed to do in this marriage, but you're not in love with that person. Well, all you guys do is butt heads and have problems and fight and argue and bicker. Things have grown sour and cold. You have to make yourself cook a dinner for this person and do things for them. In fact, oftentimes you don't even do anything for them because you're just trying to do what you're supposed to do as a husband or a wife. Well, if you were in love with that person, you would take joy in waking up early to cook them a meal and to do things with them and to take the trash out and clean the toilets and do all those lovely things and rub their back and uh, just spend time with them. You would make them feel so special and loved and adored. You would make them feel like a king or men. You would make that woman feel like a queen. It would be no problem. But not only would you be doing those things, you would take pleasure in doing it. It wouldn't wear you out and be a task. It would be a joy and a pleasure. And the same is true when it comes to serving the Lord. If you truly are in love with the Lord, you can't wait to spend time with him. You can't wait to please him. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but you can't wait to please him and do those things that make him happy and to spend time with him because you're in love with him. So ask the Lord to really show you how to fall in love with him. Ask him just to minister to your spirit. Don't serve him just because you don't want to go to hell. Serve him because you are in love with him and because you want to have a close personal relationship with him and because no matter what hell you're facing in your life, you can still trust him and lean on him and know and be confident that he is there even when you don't hear him or feel him or see him. And you can just sit and talk to him and never get tired of it and just be so in love with him. Try to focus on that because if you can do that, you're not going to be perfect, but you will have a much better relationship with him and be more successful in your obedience to him. Think about it. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was sinless. What do you think one of the key elements there was aside from the fact that he was the son of God and he was God in the flesh and all that business. There's a key element. Jesus was very much so in love with his father, God. Jesus spent a lot of time communicating with his father, God. And he was just so in love with him. He wanted to please his father. He wanted to do those things. And so he was obedient and he rose up against the temptations of the devil when the devil tried to tempt him using God's word. And he was able to go to the cross in obedience to God because he loved his father. He didn't just say, okay, God, I'm going to try and obey you because you're a good God. And wow, I just, I just don't want to go to hell. <coughs> Not that Jesus would. I'm just trying to give you an example here. But he didn't just serve the Lord out of a sense of having to serve God. He served God because he loved his father deeply, passionately, dearly, intimately. And that's one of the key ingredients, aside from the other things that I mentioned, that helped Jesus to be sinless aside from the fact that he was the son of God and God in the flesh. It always blows my mind that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are three separate beings, but yet they're also one and the same. 
something that our minds sometimes cannot seem to comprehend. So those are just some things to think about every day as you try to rest in the Lord and do what's right and think about your struggles that you're having is to ask yourself if you're really in love with the Lord. In fact, I believe it's of the utmost. Years ago, and I've shared this in other videos too, but for all of you who might have missed it, oh, and the cricket has been silent and it just starts as soon as I start recording. As soon as I start talking, it's going to start chirping. But anyways, I had shared this in previous videos. The Lord came to me and asked me, this was back in... I don't know, like 2009, 2010, somewhere in that ballpark, the Lord asked me if I was in love with him. And I said, yes. And he said, no. Do you love what you know about me or are you in love with me? And he compared it to past relationships I'd been in where I stayed up all night to talk on the phone to someone or drove across town half asleep for a quick kiss or just to say hi and see that person for a few minutes or I wouldn't stop talking about that person even though everyone was growing tired of me talking about that person I was unashamed and I was like well okay Lord you got me there basically and I guess I'm not in love with you the way I should be and I say I need you to teach me because I associate being in love with someone with physical things, like being able to see their face, be close to them physically, touch them, talk to them, hear their voice. And my personal love language is communication and touch. So in past relationships I've been in, if the person just didn't touch me or have any good communication with me, I felt so unloved. And I've been with people who purposely would do that just to torment me. So I said, you got to teach me this. So several days later or something like that, I was sitting there looking out the window and it was one of those perfectly still summer days where there's not even a single breeze. And I was looking out the window and just staring at the trees and the leaves. And the Lord said to me, he said, Lynn, can you see the wind? I said, no. Of course I can't see the wind. He said, but do you see all that the wind touches? I said, yes. He said, so is my love. And all of a sudden, this breeze, I can't explain, just circled all around about me. And I smelled this smell that I've never smelled before. And I can only describe it as fresh. And it lasted for just a few moments and it was gone. I didn't want it to leave. And I knew that was the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I began spending a great deal of time in his word. I would sit there by myself and I would write poems and songs and psalms and letters to him. And I would sit there by myself and read them out loud. Heck, like a year ago when I was really going through a lot of emotional torment and pain from a marital situation, I decided to dress up in this beautiful long white flowing dress and I wore my jewelry that a Jewish uh, jewelry maker made that had the menorah on it and stuff and I wore my necklace that's in my Facebook profile picture and here on YouTube it's a sword with a crown the Jewish man prayed over it and anointed it and made that especially for me because he said I was like an Esther I don't even deserve that comment but that's what he said and I had all of that on. I wore my beautiful, sparkly, uh, some silver slip-on high heels I have. I turned the lights out and I lit candles. And I took my prayer shawl and I hung it over the chair that was for Jesus. And I lit candles and I set a plate. And I set a plate for myself and I played this beautiful music. And it's a music that's played at a certain uh, megahertz or something. I don't remember what it is. But it's called Psalms of Alea. It's like the harp. And so I played this music and I talked to the Lord and had dinner with Jesus. 
Now, I know to some of you that probably sounds crazy, but it wasn't. I could feel his presence, and I spent the evening having dinner with Jesus. Now, I didn't really have hardly anything to eat, so I just put together some plates with, like, nuts and seeds and berries and fresh vegetables and things like that and set the plates out. So that was very, very special and meaningful to me, and I felt really close with the Lord. And then, of course, I was done with my plate, and I looked over at the plate I set for Jesus. And I said, well, Lord, you haven't really touched yours, so if you don't mind, I'm going to eat yours. So I ate that plate. Go figure, huh? But I knew the Lord was with me. And I'm sure it meant something to the Lord that I did this thing. So I'm really in love with him. There's days I feel closer to him than others. And I should feel close to him every day. But there's days I struggle with things that I'm going through and stresses. I mean, heck, I got so stressed out from so many things I was going through at once over the last year that, as most of you know, as most of you know, my hair began to fall out and my eyebrows. My eyebrows finally are coming back here lately. I haven't had to use eyebrow pencil, so thank God for that. Now, if my hair would just make a change, that would be great. But um, stress can do that to you. And the Lord doesn't want us to be stressed out. He wants us to be comforted and be at peace. We're not supposed to be stressed out. We're supposed to take all of our cares and cast our cares and our burdens upon Him. And we're supposed to let Him deal with these things that stress us out. This cricket is so loud. <laughs> you have to forgive me. Just deal with the cricket, ignore it, block it out, I guess. There's nothing I can do about it. But um, we're so we're supposed to cast our cares upon the Lord and trust in Him and just give these things over to Him and not worry about it. And as human beings that we are, that can be very, very, very hard at times. And especially if you're a person that overthinks things. Because you're trying to solve the problem or you're trying to figure out what happened. Like if you've been cheated on by somebody and you're married or in a relationship and you don't feel like they're telling you the whole truth about it, you're constantly going over and over and over it in your mind trying to solve the mystery. And sometimes that's just a mystery the Lord's going to have to solve. And all you can do is pray for the Lord to give you strength. And to pray for the imaginations to stop and pray that if you need to know that the Lord will reveal this to you and will expose the darkness with his glorious light. And most of all, pray that this person would be convicted and they would do the right thing and tell you on their own. Because ultimately, that's what we want. It's easier to forgive people sometimes for things when things involving deception, when they come to us on their own, yes, we will get hurt. Yes, we will get upset. You know, and I'm sorry for those of you caught up in dishonesty. You have to expect that. You can't just go around lying because you don't want to get in trouble with that person or you don't want to accept responsibility. You have to accept and take responsibility for your actions if you've done something you know, that person's going to be upset. That's just the way it is. However, after the upset begins to wear off, more than likely the person that you hurt will begin to forgive you and trust you more because you told them as opposed to if they catch you. So if somebody cheated on me and came to me and said, hey, I've got to tell you something, and they told me every detail about it that was necessary or that I needed to know, and they were honest with me and fessed up and said, I feel really terrible about this. I just want you to forgive me. I don't expect you to be able to forgive me right now, 
but I just, I want to tell you this. I would totally have more trust in that person, even though they did something highly distrustful and more faith in them. And my trust would begin to flourish and grow. And I would know that they were convicted enough to tell me this thing that they're more than likely not going to do it again. Or if they do, they're going to tell me as opposed to if I catch someone and then because I've caught them in the act, or maybe I caught them in a lie, I'm not going to trust them. And if you've done that, don't expect a person to trust you. You know, there's a situation where you only tell the truth because you've been caught and you feel bad because you got caught and the crocodile tears and all that business. That does not win a person's trust. So how often do we cheat on the Lord and commit adultery against him? And he forgives us over and over and over and over again. And we constantly cheat on the Lord when we serve the enemy by allowing sin in our lives and succumbing to the temptations of the flesh and we don't repent. People are always saying, God will forgive you. God will forgive you. Yes, God will and he wants to forgive you, but he cannot forgive you until you repent. And to repent doesn't mean you just say, Lord, I've done this sin and I'm sorry. Repent means not only do you confess that you've done it, not only do you ask him to forgive you, but you also begin to turn away from that sin and leave it behind you. I don't mean that you're going to be perfect. I mean, you're genuinely putting forth an effort to have a change of mind, a change of heart, and to turn away from that thing. What we're talking about here is intentional, blatant, outright sin and disobedience, willful sinning. And he cannot forgive you for willful sinning and continuous, blatant, purposeful sinning, sins of omission, unless you repent. Now, you can repent and you will make mistakes. That's possible. And you confess it right away and ask the Lord to help you. Or, as I've mentioned here quite a bit lately, if there's something in particular you're really struggling with and in your heart you're really burdened by your struggle and you really don't want to do this thing, so in your heart you're struggling and you go to the Lord and you confess that you're struggling and you need His deliverance and His help and ask Him for direction to put people and things in your life to help you repent, He will do that for you. So this video is getting long and I'm going to have to end it here, but I just want to tell you there is hope in a world that is lost, in a world that is on its way to hell, in a world where the end is near and sin is prevalent, in a world where there is so much hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ and so much division among Christians in this world, there is hope. Don't give up. Faith is not getting what you want. Faith is believing even when you don't get what you want and trusting in God's perfect plan. Faith is knowing that your God is a big God and a just and fair and mighty God. And even when you don't feel him, even when you don't see him, even when you don't hear his voice, he is there for you. And you know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. The Bible says, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It also says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible. Look up the word impossible. So we're all guilty of that, myself included, where we doubt that God is there and we feel lost and forgotten and hopeless. But that's not having faith. And if you want to please God and you want to hear from God and you want him to help you, you're going to have to trust that he is there and trust that he has got your back and he is holding your problems and your worries and all of your stresses and your sorrows and heartaches in his hand. And he is going to deliver you from all these things. And you have to trust in that, even if you don't feel him near to you or see him. He told me a long time ago, he said, there would come a day when my people will not think I'm there. They will not hear my voice. They will not feel me close to them. But he said, please tell them I am closer than ever. He said the connection, like a bad cell phone signal, will be bad because many will not have their antennas up. And because of the demonic forces will be much stronger. 
and will weaken the signal. So tell my people I'm closer than ever. Well, I had no idea at the time how I was supposed to tell his people this. I wasn't on the internet. I didn't even have the internet. I had nothing. I didn't have a blog. I, ha I, I had nothing. I had no idea how I would tell them this. So I'm telling you now. That's what he said. And I knew it was his voice. And he told me that. So know that he is closer than ever. If you're watching this and you're one of those people, he is closer than ever. Believe it, trust it, and don't doubt. He is there. God bless you and thank you so much. If you are not subscribed, subscribe to me here on YouTube. Subscribe to me on freedomnationnews.com. Pray for me, my family, this ministry. Pray for our brothers and sisters in this world. There are so many of our brothers and sisters who are getting led astray and are falling. Please pray for them. Please pray. It's very sad. Very, very, very sad. The enemy's having his way with so many, and that's why it's so important that you all know that God is closer than ever. People are falling by the wayside because they don't believe the Lord is there, because they're going by their feelings. Don't trust your feelings. Your feelings are, are like the wind. They can change from one moment to the next. Trust in God's promises of his word. Look at people like King David who cried out because they... They felt sometimes abandoned by God. But then in the next passage or the next few chapters, they were praising God for defeating their enemies. Give the sacrifice of praise. It's a sacrifice because you don't feel like doing it because you're going through hell. You're passing through the fires of hell. Praise him anyways. Trust in him. Also, and I say this all the time, but for those of you who might be watching this video for the first time, or maybe you're new to my channel. I am almost 100% viewer supported. This is my full-time ministry. This is what I do full-time making these videos. And it is a lot of time, hard work and effort. So if you feel led or moved to support me in order to, uh, or in order that I can continue to reach everybody all around the world with the truth and help people to change their lives in Jesus Christ, Please consider a financial gift. You can give via my business PayPal or my P.O. Box check or money order. Um, you can do that. Pray about it. And thank you so much to all of you who support me on Patreon. Thank you so much to all of you who do so into this ministry. I love you and appreciate it. God bless you. And to all of you who just pray because that's all you can do. Please do not feel guilty. Really don't. I know some of you feel bad. You write to me. Don't. Do what you can do. And if all you can do is pray, well then pray. Because prayer is powerful and prayer works. And I appreciate it. Pray for my health. Pray for my family. Pray for other believers. Pray for the ministry. You can pray that God will send people who can give to help support what I'm doing. Pray by all means. But don't get caught up in condemnation and guilt. I just mention this because there's a lot of people who really don't know or they forget or whatever. And unfortunately, because of the censorship, there are a lot of people who used to support me who don't even know I exist anymore. They're blocked from seeing me. They don't get my notifications. So I don't get their support anymore. And so that's a struggle. So not only do my videos get demonetized, I, I don't hardly get any support or anything. And it's becoming quite difficult. And I would like to do this full time because to be quite honest, I won't have time to do this if I do something else. And I feel like this is God's will to do this. And this is my calling. I knew he called me from an early age into the ministry to reach people because he told me so. So I know God will be faithful and just and come through. So God bless all of you. Thank you so much. And just remember to pray, pray, pray. So God bless you and thank you so much. And just remember to continue to pray for everybody. And I'm praying for you all. And I love you all so much. And I just appreciate every single one of you. You mean the world to me. I really, really mean that with all of my heart. I really strive to just be as real as possible with you and to just be myself because that's how I want you guys to be with me and that's what I like I don't like people who are all fake and whatever we all have problems we all have struggles we all 
struggle with sin. We all make mistakes. We all stuff our faces with food and let noodles fly out of our mouth, like in my last video. So God bless you. Thank you so much. Be blessed abundantly and just stay in Christ. And remember that he truly is there for you, even if you don't feel him. Thank you.